Welcome to our morning service. Let's uh, hear God's word calling us to worship him. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Lord him, all you peoples. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Well, before we lift our voices in praise, let's uh, come first of all in prayer. Let's pray together. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we would indeed praise your name that you have made a way for us uh, to draw near to you through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come then to worship you today through that way that you have provided. We thank you for our Saviour and we pray that our Lord Jesus would indeed be lifted up among us today, that he might have all the honour and the praise. Uh, We ask that you would help us, each one, to worship you with sincere hearts. Uh, Take away all distractions, we pray, and help us to focus mind and heart upon you and the things of the gospel. And we pray then that this will be a time of blessing for our souls and a time above all when our Saviour is glorified. We ask all of these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn, if you're using a hymn book, it's number 35, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. taken from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, reading from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Ecclesiastes 9, reading from verse 9. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life which he has given you under the sun all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favour to men of skill, but time 
and chance happen to them all. For man also does not know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. This wisdom I have also seen under the sun and seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it and a great king came against it, besieged it and built great snares around it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man and he by his wisdom delivered the city yet no one remembered that same poor man then I said wisdom is better than strength nevertheless the poor man's wisdom is despised and by and his words are not heard. Words of the wise, spoken quietly, should be heard, rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Good morning, children. I have a question for you. Up on the screen is going to come some words. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Can you help me? Who spoke those words? Who said that? God did, yes. God said that to Adam, didn't he? Here's another question for you. Who questioned what God said? Who said, has God indeed said? And you shall not surely die. Who said that? The serpent, yeah, the devil said that, didn't he? He questioned what God had said. We have a choice there between two views, don't we? One says that you shall not eat, you will die, and the other questions, has God said, you shall not surely die. In Deuteronomy, we read, ascribe greatness to our God. He is a rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. God is a God of truth. Everything he says is true. Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So God is a God of truth. He is trustworthy. We can trust what God says to us. Here's something Jesus said of the devil. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. He speaks a lie because he is a liar and the father of lies. So we have two different views. Who are we going to trust and believe? We only have two options, you see. We either trust and believe what God the God of truth says to us, or we believe what the devil says to us, and he is a liar and the father of lies. He's a great deceiver. He's a scam merchant. We hear us of scamming and, and all that sort of thing. He deceives and fools people. Nothing he says is true. He has no truth in him whatsoever. Who will we believe? Oh, that God would draw each one of us to put our faith and trust and confidence in the God of truth, a most trustworthy God who can be trusted fully. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, let's have our second hymn. <coughs> uh, it's number 296, Before the Throne of God Above. Let's stand to sing. <coughs> just a brief uh, report on the uh, Banner of Truth conference that I was at this past uh, week. Um, it was good to be back because, of course, it was the first conference since 2019. Numbers were somewhat down compared with uh, the pre-pandemic numbers, but there were still 200 or so uh, men there uh, gathered at the Yarnfield Conference Centre. Um, and while you can probably go online and find uh, the messages that we received, um, a very valuable part of the conference is the opportunity for fellowship with other men in different situations. Uh, so it was good to catch up with people like my, my predecessor, for example, Robert Strivens, and also it was a special joy to unexpectedly bump into Jim Renahan, uh, who is over from the States to speak at a conference uh, next week. But he came over early to attend... Uh, the Banner Conference, and I hadn't expected him to be there, so that was a particular delight. Uh, the theme of the conference was communion with God, and it was a, a very heartwarming set of, of papers. Uh, the main speaker was uh, Pastor Conrad Mbewe, who is from uh, Zambia, and he gave three messages on communion with God from uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1. Jeff Kingswood from Canada gave two papers, including one on communion in prayer, and that brought out both the importance of, of private prayer, but also the importance of public prayer. And it just struck me as, as we were gathered there, just how important it is, friends, to come together to pray, uh, whether it be on the Wednesday night prayer meeting or the Saturday night prayer meeting. Saturday night, although it's late, is, is, is easy. It's, it's, it's on Zoom, so you can easily join. I would encourage you, if you don't already, to come to at least one of those meetings where we are gathered for prayer, we hear one another pray, as well as uh, pray uh, ourselves. So that was a good uh, prompt from that paper. Robert uh, Strivens gave an excellent paper on Puritan worship, 
bringing out how the concern of the Puritans was to reform worship as well as doctrine following the Reformation uh, and how their great emphasis then was on communion with God and on a, a heartfelt worship of God rather than the sort of uh, very visual imagery of, of uh, pre-Reformation worship. Andy Hambleton gave uh, an excellent paper on uh, that verse in uh, Mark 6, come away and to a desert place and, and rest a while. And that was particularly helpful. And there were two other papers on the other well-known incident in that chapter of Jesus having communion with God and then, of course, him coming to his disciples in the boat and them knowing uh, communion with him in the midst of, of that storm. Uh, there was a global update session when uh, there were uh, reports from five uh, pastors from overseas, from places as far afield as Zambia, uh, Poland, India, Japan and uh, Sri Lanka. Murali gave uh, a report very similar to the one he gave to us last, last uh, Lord's Day evening on the, the, the work in, in Sri Lanka and the difficulties uh, they face at the present time. And uh, some of you may have or indeed seen in the news since then that uh, uh, the, the government has... Uh, uh, has agreed to make way to a, some sort of a unity government, uh, but uh, it's a very, very desperate situation there in Sri Lanka. Um, but anyway, uh, that was the conference. Thank you for letting me go. Uh, it was uh, just a joy to be back, and uh, if you do want to listen to any of the papers, as I, as I say, I think if you go on the Banner of Truth website, you'd be able to find uh, online recordings of them. Uh, a few notices then before we come to prayer. Uh, just picking up on uh, Sri Lanka, uh, you may have noticed uh, if you received the uh, online version of the notice sheet, we are holding a special collection for Sri Lanka, for believers in that country. So any monies in the box uh, today and next Sunday will be put towards uh, Sri Lanka and uh, you can, of course, pay by direct transfer if you want to, but do let Donald know if you're doing that so that he knows what your gift is for. As I said, I think, in an email that I circulated, we understand it's relatively recently since we had a special collection for Ukraine, and so you shouldn't feel guilty if you find it hard to dig any more deeply into your pockets. But if you are able to give, it will be much appreciated. That collection will be rooted through the church in Trincomalee, where uh, Murali is the pastor, so do continue to pray uh, for the situation there. Coming back to our own activities, uh, we meet again this evening, God willing, at Grange Road at 6.30. Uh, going through the week, we have an elders and deacons meeting on Zoom on uh, Tuesday evening. We have a coffee morning flyer distribution on Wednesday afternoon. We have a Bible study and prayer on Wednesday evening, and we are beginning to look at the second book of Peter, and we'll be using this little uh, study booklet. There are a number of copies uh, over there. Uh, please just take one per household, uh, because there's not a huge number. And this week we'll be starting by looking at the second of the studies in here, very logically. That's because the first one is actually an overview, which we'll probably use as our summary at the end of the series rather as we did with, with Hosea, where we had a sort of overview of what we'd looked at. So we'll, it'll, be, it'll be a second study in here on Wednesday. Do take one of those booklets if you're uh, hoping to be at that meeting. If they all go, I can order some more. Uh, but as I say, if you could restrict it to one per household, at least to begin with, that would be good. The ladies meet on Zoom on Friday, 1.30, and then our Saturday night Zoom prayer meeting at 9 o'clock, uh, as usual. And God willing, I'll be preaching then next Lord's Day, both uh, morning and uh, evening. Uh, just to advance notice that next week uh, we have the coffee morning on Wednesday. Do come along to that if you can and bring a friend with you. And if you're able to help with cakes, please speak to Diane about that. And then also next week on Thursday, the 12th of May, we have our church members meeting. So please uh, put that in your diary if you're a church member. That's... That'll be at Grange Road at 7.30, God willing. Well, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> 
Holy Father in heaven, we bow in your presence, acknowledging you to be the only true and living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. Your very being is beyond our ability to fully understand. And yet we know that you have made us for yourself to worship you to glorify you. We know that this indeed is the chief end of man, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We bow in your presence, acknowledging you to be the great God of wonders, the God who is holy, the God who is pure, the God who cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. The God before whom the sinless angels in heaven veil their faces, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And it's an amazing thing that we then can draw near to you. Ruined as we are by sin, defiled, by sin, rendered unable by sin, spiritually dead by nature because of sin. We thank you that you have made a way for us to draw near to you. We indeed acknowledge in the words of the psalm that we'll be looking at later that if you should mark iniquity, O Lord, who should stand? Because we know that each one of us is ruined by the, not only the sin of our first parents, but by our own sin. We pray that you grant to us true repentance. Grant to us a hatred of sin, we pray. Help us to turn from our sin unto you. Do not allow us to trifle with sin as though it's something that doesn't really matter. But Lord, help us to come with all our need just as we are to your throne of grace. How we praise and worship you that there is indeed forgiveness with you that you may be feared. We pray then that as a people, we may be a people who will show forth your praise. We pray that we may live as those who have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And we pray that whatever difficulties and trials you may see fit to bring into our path, you would help us to walk worthy of you. We pray that people will see something of Christ in us. We pray indeed that we may be more like him. We pray, O Lord, that you would work through the preaching of your word, both to build up your people and to convict unbelievers of their sin and their need of a saviour. Lord, we pray your mercy upon those even those among us here who are as yet unregenerate, who have not been born again of your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you have mercy upon them, we pray. Would you send your Spirit today to work in their hearts, to open their eyes, to draw them to the Saviour. May there be joy in heaven today over one sinner or more than one, who repents and comes to Christ. We pray then for your blessing upon the uh, work of this church. We think of the plans that we have for the coffee morning next week and we pray for your 
help uh, for those of us who distribute the flyers this week. Uh, we pray that uh, there will be those who will respond and come along next week to that coffee morning. And uh, we pray that uh, we might use that opportunity to share the gospel with people uh, then. We pray that uh, as a church we may continue to serve you then in this town in a way that will bring glory to your name. And we pray too for the spreading of the gospel across the world. We are mindful that we are still greatly blessed compared with many people. And we pray for those places of the world where there is a great hardship and difficulty at the present time. We think again of the war in Ukraine and the grievous carnage that has been wrought in that land. And we pray your mercy in that situation. We pray, O oh God, that you would intervene. We pray that you would help your people to continue to bear a faithful testimony. We know that there have indeed been believers who have been killed uh, in that conflict already. We pray for their families, that you would uphold them. And indeed we pray for all those who are fleeing uh, for safety in that dreadful situation. We pray again over the situation in Sri Lanka and the great uh, turbulence and instability politically in that land, uh, the massive inflation, the great hardship, particularly for the uh, poorest members of society. And we know that, that uh, your people are largely among that category. And so we do pray for them. And we pray for... Uh, pastors in that land, that you would help them in leading their flocks and uh, you, we pray that you would continue to provide uh, for their needs. So we do again commit that situation uh, to you. We pray for those of your people who are persecuted for righteousness sake, those who have to meet in secret and uh, maybe in fear of what would happen if uh, their meetings were discovered we pray, O oh God, for them, that you would draw very close to them in their, in their persecution. We know that you have said, Lord Jesus, blessed are ye when you are persecuted and uh, call all manner of evil uh, falsely for my name's sake. And we pray then for your people that they might recognise that though their situation is difficult, uh, they know that you are with them. We pray now for your continued help and blessing upon the remainder of this service. We pray for the children as they go out to junior church. We pray your blessing on the instruction that they receive. We pray for those who teach them. And we pray for the remainder of us here that you would help us to focus mind and heart upon your word. Uh, we pray that you would speak to our souls. And we ask that you would get glory to your name. For Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs> Time for the children to leave us for junior church and creche. <clears throat> the rest of us are going to sing our next hymn, which is number 558. And you'll see it's a paraphrase of Psalm 130, which we'll be turning to in a few moments. So 558, out of the depths I cry to thee, Lord hear me, I implore thee.
So if you have your Bible with you, you might like to turn to Psalm 130. Psalm 130, a song of ascents. <clears throat> Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. And with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. <clears throat> What should you do when, you've, when you find yourself in a hole? The common saying, of course, is when you're in a hole, you should stop digging. That's obviously true. But uh, if you're in a particularly deep hole, you also need to start crying out for help, don't you? And that's what the psalmist is doing here in this psalm. We read the title of the psalm. It's a song of ascents. <clears throat> and... Uh, this is part of a series, of course, of these psalms that were sung, it's believed, by the pilgrims as they made their way up to Jerusalem. And it's difficult, in a way, to see sometimes that one psalm is, as it were, higher than another, in terms of ascending. Uh, but uh, certainly within this psalm, uh, there is progression, isn't there? He begins in the depths. He's in trouble, bordering on despair. And then by the end of the psalm, he is speaking words of, of confident assurance. Sometimes when we read the psalms, it's, it's useful uh, to know the circumstances of the psalm. You could think of Psalm 51, for example. We know why David wrote that psalm, and it's helpful to have that background. Sometimes it's useful not to know as here, we don't know what the depths were that the psalm writer was in. And therefore, in a sense, we can apply it to any a deep need. And we can take the psalmist's practice uh, as an example to us. And so I begin by asking you a simple question. Have you cried out to the Lord? Maybe with a cry of desperation when you've been in some desperate need. The picture is clearly one of, of some extremity, isn't it? I'm reminded of Psalm 107 uh, and it's repeated uh, little cameos of people in, in difficulty, uh, but particularly from verse uh, 23, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do, do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man or at the wit's end. And then what do they do? Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brings them out of their distresses. Or you could think of uh, uh, the example of Jonah uh, and the difficulties, of course, that he got into. Well-known story. <clears throat> when Jonah was uh, running away from the Lord and was stopped uh, by this storm uh, that then uh, resulted in, in him being swallowed by this great fish. And we read uh, Jonah's prayer then. I cried out to the Lord from the fish's belly, cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my 
cry. It's sometimes said, isn't it, you know, when you're really down, well, the only way now is up. But it's less easy sometimes to see how that can happen. Perhaps some of you are facing difficulties and you're unable to see a way out of your situation. Maybe it's a situation of increasing desperation. You need to cry out to God. I want you to notice that this cry of the psalmist is a cry of faith. If you're going through the jungle and you uh, happen to fall into a, an elephant trap and you're in a deep pit, well, you'll start shouting for help, wouldn't you? Is anybody there? Can anybody help me? Whoever they are, you hope that somebody will hear you and come to your aid. But this isn't what, David, what the psalmist is doing here, is it? He is crying out to the Lord. In fact, uh, you may have noticed he uses uh, two words here as he addresses God. In verse 1, he says, I have cried out to you, O Lord, and that's the capitalised word, Lord, which is uh, Jehovah, the covenant name for God. And then he says in verse 2, Lord, hear my voice. And that's the word, the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master, the master of my life. And he uses this uh, pair of titles three times over in this psalm. Lord and Lord, in verses 1 and 2, and then verses 3 and 4, Lord and Lord. And then verses 5 and 6, Lord Jehovah and Lord Adonai again. And then finally, in verses 7 and 8, he uses, verse 7 rather, he uses the, the covenant name of the Lord twice over. The point is that the psalmist is crying out to someone whom he knows, the faithful God upon whom he can rely, the one who is the ruler of his life. And because of this, he prays with boldness, doesn't he? Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive. He's not uh, messing around here. He's, he's urgent. He's bold. As he prays to one whom he knows. If you're a Christian, whatever difficulties you may be in, you know the Lord. Cry out to him. Plead his covenant name. Plead your status as his servant. So he prays with boldness, but he prays with humility as well. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. I'm in need. I can't help myself. So we need to know the God to whom we pray. He's the same God today, a God of faithfulness and power. And we should pray then with boldness and with humility. So I ask you, have you cried out to the Lord when you're in trouble? But I ask you a second question now. Have you confessed to the Lord? Verses 3 and 4. We don't know what the depths were that triggered his prayer at the outset. We don't know whether, to begin with, it was actually a conviction of sin that prompted his prayer. He was clearly in trouble and he cried out to God out of the depths. But if it wasn't a conviction of sin to begin with, as he, begin, as he cries out to God, he now recognises that his greatest problem is that he needs forgiveness. His greatest problem is that if God were to mark his iniquities, he would not stand. 
Without forgiveness, why would God listen to any of their prayers? The expression he uses here, if you should mark iniquities, has the connotation of a, of a judge, as it were, taking careful notes as the evidence is laid out of what the one in the dock is accused of. And he's saying, Lord, if you should note everything down, who shall stand? God is the just judge. Now, of course, you could read this to, to say, well, if, if the Lord should mark iniquity, there's no hope for anybody, but I'm no worse than anybody else. But that's not really the point, is it? That's not what the psalmist is saying. He's saying even the holiest man or woman cannot stand before God. How much less can I? If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? The most uh, holy man, the most consecrated person is flawed and their lives are spoiled by sin. Have you come to that conviction? That if God were to deal with you on the basis of purely of justice, you deserve God's punishment. God has made us for himself. God has made us for his glory. He made man upright, but man has sought out many inventions, as Solomon says. We've gone astray. We've rejected God. We've lived our life without God. And if God were to deal with us purely on the basis of justice, we stand condemned before the judge of all. But this psalm writer is indeed a man of faith. And even as he cries out of the depths of his trouble, he recognises that God has provided a remedy. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Now doubtless, the psalm writer was very familiar with the sacrificial system. Of course he was. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Even as he sings these, uh, these words, And he knows that those uh, offerings are not just burnt offerings reflecting consecration to God, but they included sin offerings and trespass offerings that acknowledged uh, man's need of a sacrifice for sin to be dealt with. And the psalm writer, along with every other Old Testament believer, would have recognised that the blood of bulls and of goats could not themselves literally atone for sin. But they pointed forward to the one to come who would forgive sin and atone for sin. And so he rejoices that thus there is forgiveness with God. He anticipates coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the, the great Passover lamb who died so that God's forgiveness could be granted to us. Have you experienced God's forgiveness? What a joy it is to know my sins are forgiven. Oh, happy day. That fix my choice on thee, my Saviour and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day. Happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. But notice that the psalmist here doesn't say, there is forgiveness with you just so that I can be happy all the day. 
Or so that I can be sure of going to heaven when I die and enjoy the eternal happiness of heaven. Or even simply there's forgiveness with you so I don't need to worry about my sin anymore. No, he says there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. A deep sense of sin, having been in the depths over it, will lead to awe. Awe that God should choose to forgive sinners in his mercy and make a way to do that perfectly consistently with his justice. 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon put it like this, Gratitude for pardon produces far more fear and reverence of God than all the dread which is inspired by punishment. You see, if we're just uh, shrinking back in, in terror because God is going to inflict punishment on us, yes, that's a, that's a fear, of, of course. A, a horrible fear. But to receive God's forgiveness should fill us with fear in the sense of awe. Oh, what have I done to deserve such, such forgiveness? How has God deigned to show mercy to me? But he has. There's forgiveness with you, O oh Lord, that you may be feared. I will say to anybody here this morning who is perhaps feeling a sense of sin, there is forgiveness with God. Go to him afresh. In your mind's eye, go to the cross and marvel at the fact that God has provided that perfect sacrifice, that perfect atonement for your sin. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So I've asked you if you've cried out to God, have you also confessed to God that you need his forgiveness because of your sin? Third question. Are you waiting for and hoping in the Lord? Look at verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Waiting, of course, uh, by its very nature, takes time. What's the psalmist waiting for here? Or maybe he's waiting for the answer to his prayers over a particular problem. Maybe it is over this particular circumstance that has caused him at the start of the psalm to be in the depths of despair. But now he's waiting on God, confident that the God who has dealt with his sin will deal with every other problem in his life. Or maybe, having uh, acknowledged that there is forgiveness with God, he is waiting for the assurance of that salvation for himself. You see, to know that God forgives sinners is a wonderful thing. It gives us hope. But we need to know that God has forgiven us. Because not everybody will go to heaven. Not everybody will be forgiven. Here then the psalmist is waiting upon God. And if he is waiting as it were, with that desire for the assurance of salvation, it's worth noting that he is not encouraging a passive sort of fatalism. No, he is looking out eagerly for the answer to his prayers. I remember a time many years ago uh, when I was out for an early morning walk up on the hills in the Cotswolds and it was still dark, and I stopped and leant against a gate and looked over towards the east, uh, and there was an outline of the hill, and then suddenly there was that 
glimmer of light. And I've been looking for it. Sure, the sun must come up soon. Well, of course, I knew it was going to. The sun comes up every day. But nevertheless, I was looking forward, looking out for it, waiting for the light to come. Here, then, we have the psalmist eagerly waiting for God. My soul waits for the Lord, he says, more than those who watch for the morning. And he repeats it then for emphasis. The last watch of the night was between uh, three and six o'clock in the morning. And those uh, keeping watch over their city at night then, if their, their uh, rota, the rota meant that they were on duty for that last watch of the night, they would be watching for the rising of the sun. Yes, they knew it was going to come they'd be eagerly waiting for it, praying it might come soon. That's the spirit then with which we must wait for God as we pray. Let's keep looking for answers to our prayers. Let's not just pray in a perfunctory sort of way, but let's uh, pray with eager expectation that God is a God who answers prayer. And the psalmist says, in his word, I hope. And that's why we can be patient as we pray, because biblical hope is a well-grounded confidence upon God's word. It's based on the truthfulness of God. It relies on the promises of God. It looks forward to the future that God sets before us. In his word, I hope. This book is such a wonderful source of comfort and strength and hope for the Christian believer, isn't it? And we need to make sure we follow the psalmist's example here of hoping in God's word. And hope then yields patience. I mean, in some ways, verse 6 sounds rather impatient, doesn't it? I'm waiting for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. Lord, let it come. But it's because of hope that the psalmist continues eagerly to wait. If you haven't got hope, you give up. You eventually turn away. Perhaps you've been waiting for a, a bus. And you wait. For, to begin with, your no reason not to expect it. It's due in five minutes' time, but then that time comes and doesn't arrive. And you're a bit annoyed that it's been delayed, but it'll be here shortly, and then, of course, it doesn't come, and it doesn't come. And eventually you start uh, phoning for a taxi. You give up on the bus. You lose hope in the bus service. But if you have hope, you continue to wait. And so the psalmist here, because of his hope in God's word, he's willing to wait for God to answer his prayer. Again, the Spurgeon's comment is very helpful on this passage. He writes, the Lord's people have always been a waiting people. They waited for his first advent. Now they wait for the second they waited for a sense of pardon. Now they wait for perfect sanctification. And that's true, isn't it? We continue to look forward as believers. We are waiting, as the Apostle Paul puts it, waiting for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And of course, many times in life, we have to continue to wait on God. I remind you of Psalm 123 that we looked at some weeks ago. As the eyes of a servant look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes are made to the hand of a mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. We continue to wait upon God and look to him. So are you waiting on the Lord 
in your situation here, you continue to hope in him. That will sustain your waiting. You've got particular difficulties that you're needing answers to prayers for. Notice finally the last of two verses where the psalmist moves from his own personal inner experience and uh, cogitation to applying it to you and me. In verses 1 to 6, he is spoken in the first person of himself and his own, his own feelings of despair uh, to begin with uh, until eventually he moves to hope and, uh, and confidence. But then he turns to us and says, Hope in the Lord. He addresses his whole nation to begin with. O Israel, hope in the Lord. What a necessary exhortation that was for God's ancient people. Israel was so quick to lose hope and to stop waiting upon God and therefore to turn aside to idols. But these were God's people by national covenant. Of all people, they should hope in the Lord. And the genuine believers among the nation needed encouraging to persevere as well. Those who are not genuine believers, of course, needed to recognise that the Lord alone could save them. Hope in the Lord... For with the Lord there is mercy. It's humbling to recognise that we need mercy, but it's reassuring to know that God extends mercy. Have you come to church today broken, backslidden, despairing, in the depths, Hope in a merciful God. He delights in mercy. Indeed, with him, the psalm writer continues, is abundant redemption. Plenteous grace with thee is found, as Charles Wesley puts it, grace to cover all my sin. There is enough power in the blood of Christ to redeem you from all your iniquities. No matter how many they are, no matter how bad they are, no matter how long they've been indulged, with him there is abundant redemption. Jesus himself said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. He offers abundant life that flows from experiencing God's forgiveness as a result of abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Every last man, woman and child of his chosen people shall truly be redeemed. So as we conclude this morning, take encouragement from this beautiful psalm. And if you've come to realise that your sin has plunged you into a deep hole, stop digging and take encouragement from this psalm. Cry out as the psalmist does here and continue to do so until God answers in his grace. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the great redeemer of the lost. Put your trust in him, the one who died to rescue his people, to take them out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, to set our feet upon a rock, to put a new song in our mouths, even praise to our God. May God give to us all the eyes of faith to believe and rejoice in the abundant redemption that is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
Lord our God, we come before you acknowledging that sin has indeed plunged us into the deepest of depths. <clears throat> and but for your grace, we should fall into the bottomless abyss. And yet we thank you that there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. We thank you that with you there is mercy and abundant redemption. And we pray, O oh God, that each and every one of us here this morning may know the joy of sins forgiven and may continue to wait upon you to answer all our prayers and bring us at last safely to glory. Please hear us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our last hymn is one that's uh, one of the EMW hymns, His Mercy is More. Let's uh, stand to sing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.